Good evening. Will everybody take their seats, please? Hi, Doug. <clears throat> okay. Hi. Um, welcome to the uh, Friends Speaker Series. My name is Tom McCann. I'm the president of the Friends this year. And before I begin, oh, uh, I'm nervous enough. Don't. Uh, <laughs> before we begin, I could I ask you to turn off your um, your cell phones and, and beepers. Thank you. Uh, and also, before I begin, a special thanks to uh, uh, Bert and Rosalie Cohen for donating the calendars that are on your seats. Thank you again. It's um, my honor to introduce uh, distinguished actress um, Tyne Daly and to tell you uh, about the special format for tonight's program. Uh, Tyne Daly will be uh, interviewed by someone we all know, um, Vita Palladino, managing director of the Howard Gottlieb uh, Archival Research uh, Center. Following the uh, interview segment, uh, there'll be a question and answer period when you can ask Tyne Daly some questions. Um, Tyne Daly is, as we all know, an extraordinarily versatile and gifted actress who's built an impressive resume of work on uh, both stage and screen. <clears throat> She's the daughter and the sibling of well-known actors. Um, Miss Daly took up the family uh, profession at a very early age and crafted a successful and diverse career stretching four decades. She earned her actor's equity card at the age of 15, and I'm sure she's got a very low number. <laughs> um, she made her first uh, TV appearance um, um, within a year of that, and um, her Broadway debu debut followed in 1966. She was later cast as the first female partner to uh, Clint Eastwood's uh, Dirty Harry Callahan. Um, yeah. <clears throat> in uh, 1981, she landed the part of Detective Mary Beth Lacey on the TV series Cagney and Lacey. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> that, that role made her a household name and brought her an impressive four Emmys um, during the season uh, that ran, I guess, for eight, eight years, wasn't it? Six and a half, sorry. <laughs> anyway, when the series ended, uh, Pine Daly headlined the Broadway revival of Gypsy in 1990. <laughs> they liked that. <laughs> Winning, she won multiple awards, including a Tony for lead actress in a musical. Um, <clears throat> her performance as uh, Mama Rose. In the past 15 years, she's continued to uh, add to her rich body of work with performances on stage and screen, including the television series uh, Christie and Judging Amy. Um, yeah. <laughs> This is something new. We usually don't get this, this much applause. Uh, <laughs> uh, she brought home another Emmy for her work on uh, uh, each of those, uh, those shows. Uh, most recently, uh, Tyne Daly returned to Broadway in the critically acclaimed Rabbit Hole, which uh, debuted at the Mat Manhattan Theater uh, Club in February 2006. But before we welcome our guest, uh, please sit back and enjoy uh, these uh, few minutes from her stellar career. We have a short uh, film. Thank you. Lights, lights. You're right, Herbie, it is for the best. The old act was getting stale and tired, but the new one, Herbie, look at the new star. She's going to be beautiful. She is beautiful. Finished? We're just beginning. And there's no stopping us this time. I had a dream, a dream about you, baby. It's gonna come. 
come true, baby. They think that we're through, but baby. Wondering if I'll still have a job when I get back there. What difference does it make? What do you want to be a cop for anyway? Why aren't you married and having kids like everybody else? Why aren't you? Nobody in their right mind's asking. Coitus interrupt us. I beg your pardon? Oh, Coit Tower. It's vaguely phallic, don't you think? Not of it that way. I make up names for things. For instance, you are Cold Bold Callahan with his great big 44. Every other cop in this city is satisfied with a 38 or 357. What do you have to carry that cannon for? So I hit what I aim at, that's why. 357 is a good weapon, but I've seen 38s careen off windshields. No good in a city like this. I see. So it's, um, it's for the penetration. Does everything have a sexual connotation with you? Only sometimes. Mm -hmm. Want to go have a few beers? Okay. I've got only a vague recollection of that name. Well, try harder. You and Zoller were cellmates for three months. I bet you remember the size of his underwear. Yeah, well, Greenhaven was a dark time for me. My therapist says that I blocked it out. Well, we can provide recall therapy. Starts in a holding cell with a bunch of junkies, throwing up on your shoes. You moved guns for Zala before. Must have been in my troubled past. Now I'm a productive member of the community. Your rap sheet says different, Mr. Werner. Mistaken identity both times. Witness intimidation both times. Hey, it's a democracy. Everybody's entitled to their point of view. And he's mine. All right, Zoller caused the death of a cop. Now we're gonna get him, and anyone who refuses to help goes down with him. Hey. Hard, Mr. Werner. As hard as we could possibly make it. <laughs> if you can't convince us that you don't know anything, you better have relatives in Brazil that'll be glad to see you. <laughs> working at the Sleep Lagoon Defense Office for a few months. All the petty arguments and the haggling and the lack of cooperation. You're too sentimental and emotional about this, Alice. You're too cold-hearted, Alice. Alice, you're collecting money and handing it over to the lawyers while the families are going hungry? Alice! Alice, they say you can't be trusted because you're a communist. Because you're a Jew, Alice. Okay. That's the way they feel about me. The hell with them, I hate them too. I hate their language. I hate their enchiladas. And I hate their goddamn mariachi music. <laughs> you all right, miss? <laughs> yes, I'm fine. I feel better now. Everything is as it should be. A mother is lying on top of a sanitation truck bound for the city dump, and a son is running around with a floozy who came looking for a good time and stayed to ruin an American woman's life. Who gave up nights of rest to rub Vix on your chest. Who nursed her sonny boy till he was four My life has been in vain This country 
worries down at rain Cause a mother doesn't matter, no A mother doesn't matter, yes A mother doesn't matter anymore Are you finished, Mama? <laughs> Yes, sonny boy. Good night, Mama. Good night, sonny boy. <laughs> My name is not Sonny Boy. <laughs> Good night, Albert. Good night, Mama. You're just like your father. You'd marry anything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. What is it, honey? <laughs> I didn't want it. I didn't want the baby. And now it's gone. And? I wished it. Then it really happened. I just want to take it all back. Lauren, <laughs> listen to me. You did not cause your mother's miscarriage. I understand that, that you maybe wish you'd acted differently, but... We don't get to choose what we feel about anything. Do you understand? Your mother's going to feel sad for a little while. Because it is sad. And she's probably going to feel responsible. And we'll have to let her know that she's not to blame either. Nobody's to blame. And that kind of makes it hurt more. But it's her journey, sweetheart. And she'll get through it. She's a remarkable woman, dear mother. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Miss Tyndaley. That's a very interesting collection of clips. <laughs> hmm. I'll get you for this, Vita. It's a large body of work. The reason we're doing Q&A is because I haven't got a speech. <laughs> I I'm working on it. Forgive the uh, hair thing. I, every time I finish a show, I do something terrible to my hair. And it's one of the ways I, I put characters to sleep. Um, but this, this won't last for long. Don't get used to it. <laughs> it, it, it could change while we're talking. Uh, <laughs> First, I want to thank you for giving us your archive, which is, as you probably have already seen, on exhibition. We consider the exhibition part of our educational outreach as also part of this lecture series has become. And so in that archive is a biography. It's a history of an industry, and it portrays you in that industry. So this is really going to be just a schmooze, because <laughs> I've never done this either. <laughs> OK. So you can just relax. Easy for you to say. <laughs> what I'm dying to know. You were born in Wisconsin, the Midwest, yes. but a progressive state. <laughs> you grew up in Westchester, 
Well, uh, uh, Suffern, New York is in Rockland County, actually, Rockland, Rockland oh, County. West Chester County. That's for me upstate. Right. Rockland's better. And you've lived in California for decades. Do you feel connected to any one part of the country? Uh, no. I think, uh, uh, I wish I had a hometown. Uh, but I don't really. I was in nine schools before the sixth grade because we traveled around a lot mm. uh, because my parents were actors. Um, so I went in the family business. Uh, but I, I don't feel love. I, my children, I have California children. That's, that's really surprising. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, mostly you go where the work is, do you know? So did you choose acting or did acting choose you? <laughs> I had and a did you, you know, did your family have an influ influence on that? And what was your, when you started out, when you got your equity card, what was your goal? What was your dream? What was compelling you? I think I knew from the time I was about eight that I thought it was a really, really fun game. Um, I, my parents used to do something uh, for the young actors in the room, if there are any, there was something called 10 for 10 week stock. 10 plays in 10 weeks. And from the time I was really small, we'd go and be turned over to, uh, to ushers, you know, and you, your parents brought you to the theater, and then these people came on the stage who had different hair and different clothing and spoke in different ways, and, and then at the end of the play, your parents came back and took you home, and I thought that was really, really neat <laughs> and very fascinating. Um, I had a long talk recently with Julie, uh, no, um, June Havoc, June Havoc, the sister of uh, Gypsy Rosalie, who became a friend of mine when I was doing Gypsy, and, um, she's 92 now. I, I went to her to say, um, you know, I'm, I'm 60 now, uh, Junie, what do I do now? She said, diversify. <laughs> <laughs> but we, that's when she started to write plays and, and, uh, and uh, direct. She, you know, she had been on the stage since she was 18 months old um, dancing. At any rate, um, the talk was about whether or not you, you, you know, you're born to the work or you're born for the work. Um, I think I was born to the work, uh, that there was so much surrounding influence in terms of the people that my parents knew and, and worked with and the folks that came, you know. I mean, I saw uh, uh, Judith Addison throw up in the living room when she had too much to drink. I, I, <laughs> I knew that actors were human beings, um, which was an advantage. Um, um, so I went in the family business and uh, don't regret it, except for every other day. You know. uh, <laughs> But I think there are people that are born for it that come from God knows where with no influences and somehow manage to be Gracie Moore. Uh, and then there are those of us who, who kind of ply our trade and, and it's, another, it's another take on how the work gets done. So what was your goal? What was your dream? When you, when you made your decision, you knew you were, you were going to do it. What did you imagine for yourself? Well, I think when I was 15, I wanted to be the greatest actress in the English speaking language. And when I was about 19, all, I, I just wanted a job. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so the realities do come, come in pretty fast. Um, uh, I remember saying to, to, when I graduated from the American Musical and Dramatic Academy, which was a two-year program that I went to after I quit Brandeis, because um, <laughs> uh, I wanted to act. Uh, um, there was kind of rush week, you know, there were, there were um, agents that came around and saw the, the student efforts and what do they call them, showcases. Um, so there were a lot of people that, that wanted to represent me and um, the guy I wound up going with, a wonderful old school agent named Jay Wolf, long gone from us, uh, but he said, what do you want? And I said, well, I want to die on stage at the age of 87. And he said, that's kind of a hostile thing. And I said, well, only, only after I'd finished my last speech. I, you know, I don't want to <laughs> cheat the audience at all. Um, I was always aware of the long haul, that I wanted to do it for a long, long time, and not just uh, kind of do it and make my fortune and get out. There's a lot of people who want to do that, you know, make a kind of, it's, in the old days, you know, parents didn't want their children to be actors because they figured they'd starve. Um, now there seems, it's like everybody wants to be an actor, or, a, you know, a, a top athlete by the time they're 14 or something, and, and make a killing and, and then, do something else. Um, but I, I had some kind of notion that I wanted to do this for a long, long time. You're a working girl. Yeah. <laughs> Beg your pardon. <laughs> <laughs> K 
Can you give us an idea what your experience was like as an acting, young acting student in New York City when you attended the American Academy of Dramatic Art? Uh, AMDA was started by Philip Burton, who uh, was an Englishman and had been the coach and, and mentor of Richard Burton, and he wanted to start a school in New York that was like Lambda because uh, he thought that the American musical form was the musical theater. Uh, that that was, aside from jazz and Coca-Cola, that that was our, our contribution. Um, this is before the English invasion of the late 80s and 90s. Um, and um, I don't know whether to talk to you or to talk to you, so I'm going to put this in the middle. Um, that was always a good way to go. <laughs> so at that, the reason I, you know, I liked the school and chose the school was because it was, it was going to teach you not only the method and, um, oh God, your rhythmics and, and speech and fencing and all that kind of stuff, but we also had to do uh, singing. Everybody had to sing, everybody had to dance, whether you wanted to or not. Um, I knocked my two front teeth out uh, skipping out on a dance class uh, one time, one spring, uh, which was a lesson to me. But it didn't make me go to dance class anymore. Um, he just felt that the Ameri an American actor had to be able to, to function both uh, uh, as a, as a straight actor and as a musical performer. So I like that because my, my ideal, I think, was not at all the silver screen. Uh, my dad worked in television, television wasn't it either. I was in love with Broadway and the idea of the musical theater. I've only gotten to do a smidge of that, but um, it's, always, it's always a lot of fun because that's, that's a fantasy time. Mm -hmm. We're not done yet. <laughs> Were there well-known productions that you auditioned for but you didn't get into? Oh, we speak of Gypsy now. Is that what you want me to talk about? No. I was 13. Were there well-known productions? Well, we weren't allowed to audition, and we weren't allowed to work in between, but of course I did, because I'm a cheater. Um, so I went, and, I went and did what was left of 10 for 10 weeks stock. I went and did eight shows in 10 weeks at the China Dragon Dinner Theater in Hooksett, New Hampshire. You, you can't make up stuff like that. Uh, <laughs> and I did a, se a season there. Um, which had some straight plays in it, and then also had Stop the World, I Want to Get Off, and She Loves Me, and uh, oh gosh, um, we did uh, uh, Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum. That was a funny season, because I, I, I played both the largest and the smallest uh, person. <laughs> I, I played Gargantua uh, with a big jewel in my navel, and my breasts padded out to here with you know, twirlies on it, in, uh, um, in Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum. And I played Lotus Blossom in Tias of the August Moon, uh, that whole week, I, I strapped a belt around my knees. I have to stand up now, so that so that when we did all the building of the sets and stuff, I was I was doing this all week, so I could so I could perfect the walk. And you try and hammer nails with a thing like that; it's very difficult. Um, and I played oh, yeah, anyway. So that was a fun, but I wasn't supposed to. That was cheating. Uh, what was the question? The question was: Was there productions you didn't get into that you wanted to that you had your eyes set out on? Gee, I wanted to be in, I wanted to be in, um, what's that one that ran the longest of all? Oh, golly, off-Broadway. Uh, try to remember a time and set the Fantastics. Oh, I yeah. went and auditioned for that. I, well, I auditioned for everything. Because in those days, you'd, you'd go and there'd be a line of, you know, 100 girls or something, and, and you got to sing the last eight bars of As Long As He Needs Me, and then goodbye. So we auditioned for everything just for the practice. Um, How'd you do with the rejection? I'm not getting the part. I always thought they were wrong. <laughs> I thought they made a terrible kind of mistake, girl. and I still do. Yeah, I, I've, and that's what I advise young actors to do. If they don't choose you, they're wrong, and their the project is doomed to failure. <laughs> I went once. I, I went up for a movie with Luciano Pavarotti. This is way later. They were trying to make Luciano into uh, into uh, uh, Mario Lanza then, and it was a it was a movie called Yes, Giorgio. And it was kind of a cute movie. And the reason I wanted to do it was because of him and because at the end there was a, a hot air balloon sequence where they, where they were hot air ballooning across uh, the wine country. In, uh, and that's what the movies can do, you know, take you to these fantastic places. So I thought, I just want a hot air balloon with a, you know, a pav. That would be fantastic. <laughs> so I went to the audition. This is, you know, I had an actual reputation and stuff. I'd made a couple movies and, uh, and done, uh, I think it might have been after Cagney and Lacey, I'm not sure. Anyway, I went and they said to me, do you think that Mr. Pavarotti is sexy? And I said, oh, for heaven's sake, sure, imagine the sounds he might make in bed. No laugh. No laugh. I was in the wrong room. I mean, I knew I was in the wrong room. So they made that movie with uh, somebody, Kathleen somebody, and it was, a, it was a dead failure. And the reason was they didn't hire me. 
C'est pour ça. Ah. <rire> What were your early great breaks? What do you consider your really great breaks? Um, well, I sort of don't believe in breaks, but I, I know they're there. Of course they are. There's happenstance. There's luck. There always is. I was working as a human stapler in, uh, in um, <laughs> the village. I was stapling together cosmetic samples for, I think, $2.50 an hour. Uh, and I got a call from my agent who had taken us on. Uh, stop that. Um, and uh, he said, you have to go right now to the Chairland Theater. Uh, the actress has dropped out. They open in a week. The frontline critics are coming down for the very first time and get over there. So I quit. The, I'm left, you know. The guy wouldn't let me leave. And so I just said, okay, I, I left. And I went to the Cherry Lane and I read for them and then was take, you know, asked to wait upstairs and I had to listen to four other actresses read, which was pretty much torture, real torture. And then they said, okay, uh, you're hired. And I said, when do I start? And they said, now. And I called my then young husband and said, bring me some, the right shoes, because I can't go on the stage in these shoes that I'd worn to work as a human stapler. So um, he, uh, he brought me some shoes, and we went into rehearsal right then. And that was a, that was a break. The girl, uh, what was her name? Rosemary something. She was under contract to Universal, and she had to go back and make a bad movie with um, Dean Martin, a Western. Anyway, uh, so I had a week. To, to figure it out. Um, and uh, Bert Sheveloff, who wrote um, Funny Thing After the Way to the Forum and other things, Bert, um, you know, he would say, okay, and now you cross down to the, to the file case and then you wait and after he says the next two lines, then you cross over to the water cooler. And I was pretty, I was 19 or something or 20. And I said, you know, why? And he said, just do it, then go home and figure out why and come back tomorrow. I mean, that, that why stuff was up to the actor. Not, nobody was going to explain that stuff to you. That was, that was the interior work you were so supposed to do. It was a very good lesson. So I consider that a break. And I got a nice notice from uh, Walter Kerr, a little one-line notice when we opened. And so, because it was the first time, off-Broadway wasn't even a, 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 a phrase then, you know. Uh, but so that was a break, for true. Who were your mentors? Did you have any? I don't know that I had mentors. I had teachers. I had real good teachers. I had a, a terrific teacher at Brandeis for one year um, who was a humanities teacher and it hadn't anything to do with, with the theater. I had, another, I had a good theater man there for half a year, Jasper Dieter, whom I understand is in your archives, who ran the Hedgerow Theaters in the 30s, uh, Jap Dieter. I was telling this story before you all came, but he was... He, he seemed to me then like the oldest man in the world. He was probably something like 64. And he had this little white hair that stuck up, and he lived on booze and cigarettes, and he was fantastically exciting uh, man, and just an, just an old theater guy who was great. Um, shall I tell the Reach for the Star story? You like that? Somebody liked that story. He said to me one day in rehearsal, I think we were doing a Lilium or something, and he had these wonderful hands that seemed to be these kind of farmer hands. He had played the first uh, Pa Jode in, in Tobacco, no, not Pa Jode, the other Pa in Tobacco Road, can't remember. At any rate, he said to me one day, we were doing Lilium, he said, reach for the stars and you'll choke to death. Now go to work. <laughs> so he was like pragmatic, I liked him. Um, who else? Uh, uh, Phil Burton, Richard Burton, who, uh, Philip I mean, uh, who, who taught a Shakespeare class that should have been taken by everybody, truck drivers, you know, janitors, anybody, because he was, made that stuff so alive. I've never gotten to play any of that and still it sustains me. Um, today, I went to the um, Boston Public Library where I'd never been, and there's a, there's a great show there called uh, 10,000 Jones. And I'm kind of just wandering around wondering what this night was going to be like, and I got um, a quote. I'm always saved by quotes. There was an open page of a, of a thing from uh, it's Henry VI, part one. I've got to get my glasses. Did I give you my glasses? Oh, no, they're here, they're here. Thank you, Sean. Look, he goes, immediately goes, and that's so fantastic. He was about to. Um, so I'm just, I'm just looking around, you know, and, and I found this thing that seemed to me all about what we we're doing today. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. This is Henry the, uh, the Sixth, part one. It's, the, it's one of Joan La Pucelle's. Glory is like a circle in the water, which never ceaseth to enlarge itself, till by broad spreading 
it dispersed into naught. I love that. So it's sort of like being on TV. Uh, <laughs> anyway, we're in the dispersal part here. Uh, the not part we'll talk about later. I like that. What was the question? I'm on, a, I'm on another question. So, how did you get to be the first female partner of Dirty Harry Callahan in The Enforcer? It's funny that, you know, that, that scene you showed was a scene that I wrote. Um, he was an extraordinarily generous man and we needed a bridge between two scenes. The very first scene I shot, and then a couple of weeks later we sh shot another one, and they, they didn't like the scene that was happening in the middle. Um, and we went off and improvised a scene. Uh, and he'd played that character for so long. I mean, he'd already done th two of them, I guess. This, mm. uh, I think the enforcer was the third one. And I didn't know who I was or what I was doing. And I had, I had two little kids. We were in San Francisco. I, had this nanny that my husband had hired who was 17, so I actually had three little kids. And <laughs> he was busy, the kids were wandering off and he was so nervous. And so we're doing, we're improvising the scene. It was just terrible, terrible. And at that time, Eastwood had open um, uh, dailies. The days work from before, we'd all go and have a, you know, a sandwich and a drink and something and sit and watch the work. Anyway, I just was nervous and awful in the scene. and. Um, so I begged him to do something else, and he said, no, it's fine, it'll be fine. And Jackie Green, who was his longtime cinematographer, <laughs> wonderful, who directs now, he's an extraordinary man, he said uh, to Eastwood, who do you think you are, John Cassavetes? <laughs> Which Eastwood got really angry about. Anyway, so I kept going to him in the course of the whole movie, saying, we've got to fix that scene, you know, between the Coit Tower scene and whatever. And he said, okay, you know, I finally, Warm down, I guess. And he said, uh, you know, what would it be? And so I wrote the Coit Tower scene. And the last day of shooting, he said, okay, we'll do it. We'll, we'll, and if it's better than the other one, I'll put it in the movie, which he did, which I was grateful for. How did I get the job? I had just finished doing uh, The Three Sisters and a play called Ashes, which I adored, at the Mark Taper Forum. And I had auditioned at the Mark Taper Forum for every play they had for eight years in a row. Hello, my name is Daly. I live in Westwood. I've got two little kids. Uh, my husband's worked for you. Uh, and finally, I, got, I won those jobs and got terrible notices in the, in the, uh, uh, the checkoff, but got really good notices in, in Ashes. Anyway, I felt like sort of a real, you know, an accredited actress. I was feeling pretty assy. And um, so they asked me to do this Clint Eastwood movie. Uh, I, I was given the, you know, the, the script, and, and I said, uh, no, thank you. And I had no idea that the glamorous answer in the movies is no. Because the glamorous answer in the theater is yes. You know, they say, can you juggle? And you say, yes, of course I can. And you, you know, will you sweep the floor? Certainly, absolutely. Uh, so yes is all your willingness of, of acting in the theater. But this was when I learned that the glamorous answer in the movies is no. Because I said no, and they said, well, would you, would you like more money? <laughs> and I said, no, uh, no, I just, uh, uh, no, thank you. And they said, well, uh, w would you like uh, more money? <laughs> and I said, uh, no, thank you. I'm, I just think she's, you know, I don't think she's really worth my time since I'm a Chekhovian actress and all. <laughs> and uh, then they said, um, in this tone, I'll never, it, the tone was like a, some kind, like my ministerial grandfather. My grandfather was a Methodist minister. They said, would you like to meet Clint? And I said, sure, uh, you know, because all I remember about him was that he, that he was a really good looking cowboy in a television show, um, Rawhide, which I still know all of the lyrics to the um, theme song. Um, and I said, fine. And I went to meet him at, over at Warner Brothers and he said, what's the matter with you? Why don't you want to be in my movie? And I said, because the, because the woman is a cartoon. She said, you know, might as well black my teeth out like Lucille Ball. She's just a joke. She's not a human being. And he said, what do you mean? And I, we went, page for page through the script, and I said, you know, she's not a person. And if, you know, if she was a person, I'd like to do it. And uh, so then he let me, the, the, so then he hired me and, and, to, and let me make her into a person, which was enormously generous because he didn't have to, I didn't have any real reputation except, you know, as a kind of a, a victim. I played a lot, I played about, I did about 15 years playing people, you know, who, who had too many children or drowned their kids in the shower or, 
their brother hung themselves or you were retarded or you know just any all every known victim which was the way that actresses came up in those days first first you play the victims and then you know you play the girlfriend of the girl and then you play the girl herself and then you play at any rate, so I'd, I'd been through my victim career. What, what is it difficult? Question? <laughs> New question. <laughs> is it difficult to switch from theater acting to movie acting to television acting back to stage acting? Is it difficult? Is the technique different for you? And is it difficult to get back into um, one particular mode? Yeah, sure. Um, in the beginning, not anymore. Uh, you know, I just was in New York and, and had to sort of show everybody again that I do have some theater chops. Uh, you know, and for a while they sort of look at you like the TV girl. Because um, people's memories are really short. Uh, uh, the acting all comes from the same place. Uh, always comes from the same place. It comes from your vitals. It comes from your, from your womb and your, and your guts and your heart and, you know, uh, sort of up the chakras. Uh, the the Technique, which is really just tricks, is uh, different for, for each one because of the size you are. You know, on, on, on television, you're, you're that tall, four inches tall, uh, except when your eyes are each. You know, uh, on the movies, it's like too huge. But that's just technique. That's modifying your technique to the, whatever the medium is. I always was very piggy. I wanted to do everything, you know, including radio, which I really like, because um, you don't have to get dressed up. Uh, <laughs> But no, the, I think that um, if you are lucky enough to have experience in, in each of those places, then you, get, then you figure out the technique for them. But the acting comes from the same place. Were you prepared for the success and adoration of your fans and you know, the, the lack of privacy that came I don't have it? adoring fans. I have, uh, uh, no, I don't, uh, no, I, I don't. Anybody want to change your mind? <laughs> no, I have respectful fans. I have, I, have, I have fans who sort of get it about me. I remember once a long time ago, I, I complained to an early uh, agent I had that, that I only got letters from people who seemed to be very badly educated or had something really wrong with them. <laughs> uh, and uh, most letters I got on Cagney and Lacey were asking for Sharon Glass's number. Uh, <laughs> Truly, yeah. Uh, uh, but, and he said to me, but it's because you seem to be approachable. You seem to be someone that might answer. You seem to be someone that you, that, that, can, that you can uh, you know, um, talk to. You're not so glamorous uh, as uh, you know, to be this idealized, unapproachable thing. And I said, N not glamorous? Um, <laughs> I mean, I didn't even know. Um, but it depends on what you play. You know, if you if you are Madonna and your act is uh, masturbating in front of uh, t teenage children in your brassiere, then you can expect to have people follow you down the street trying to tear your clothes off. I mean, that's <laughs> what your act is, and so there you have it. I play someone who's sort of like your Aunt Fanny or your sister or something, uh, and always have. And so um, I, the pressure of kind of mobs of, of frenzied fans is something I don't experience. I experience people in the supermarket, you know, saying, uh, uh, gee, you got fat. Uh, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. But it's, uh, uh, it's a different deal for me. <laughs> but if people didn't know who you were, they wouldn't say such things, would they? <laughs> they feel totally uh, uh, capable of saying that without even blushing. <laughs> On both TV, long, the long-standing TV series, Cagney and Lacey and Judging Amy, both seem to have this family quality w among the cast. Is it hard to leave that? I mean, you spent six and a half years with Cagney and Lacey. It must be a mixed bag of feelings. <clears throat> Can you describe what that's like? I mean, you do a show and you do it for a much less period of time. Yeah. Um. Well, a couple of thoughts about that question. I, I like the work as team sport. I always think of it as team sport. I think the reason that we should be putting a lot of money into the arts instead of into sport is because in the arts there's no loser. Um, sports are great, don't mistake me, but there always has to be somebody who wins and somebody loses in the theater or the band or the orchestra or the you know, uh, county chorus or all that stuff we used to have in school. Everybody wins. 
you know, except arguably the parents. <laughs> but, uh, no, everybody enjoys it. Everybody does the team effort. So I like the team effort of it. Some people think it's competition sport. I think it's team sport. So I've always liked getting a team and establishing the team and getting to know each other and having it be a family. The reason that people think that Cagney Lace was on for eight years is because, of course, we were canceled twice. So we sat out for eight months before we resumed and then another time. But actually, it was six, year, six seasons, six and a half, with my two other Cagneys. Uh, but yeah, so I put, I put Cagney Lacey to bed <laughs> twice. <laughs> then we had to take her out of the drawer and do it again. Um, I'm still in the mourning period or period of adjustment or whatever it is over, over Amy, judging Amy, do you know? Um, I'm <laughs> I'm about to go back, and, and Miss Brenneman is, is uh, getting a, a cast party together. Um, I, did, I did a show in New York called uh, Mystery School, which did not go over for, uh, completely as we wanted it to. I, it was a um, one-woman piece. I played five different characters. It was about faith. We'd done it at Long Wharf and then took it into New York. And I got into New York, and they put me up in this really kind of cool um, uh, apartment on 12th Street in the village, and it was all this stuff. And I thought, well, this is really neat. I've got this little balcony and stuff. I think I'll have a cast party. Oh, no cast. <laughs> I have no cast. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's me and the lighting guy, and, the, and, the, and uh, that's it. Um, so I, I, I called up all the old gypsy colleagues, and we had a cast party anyway. <laughs> um, the, a lot of actors are seeking surrogate family, I think, when they work. Uh, I've been enormously lucky to have colleagues that I hang with and that I know afterwards and that uh, don't leave my life immediately, the, the job is over. When you win awards, like you, you've not been nominated 14 times for Emmys and you've won 16. <laughs> 16. Those are the things they, they, uh, they run together. She's a show off. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's acting. See, and acting have you won six of those? Yeah. Yes. And you walked home a Tony. Yeah. In uh, satisfaction in your own work, is there anything more with an Emmy or a Tony? Is it, how do they, they feel when you get those? We will never experience this, as you well know. Listen, it ain't over till it's over, babe. Uh, <laughs> uh, prizes. Prizes are funny. Um, and I don't have an enormous stake in them, although I kind of like having them, but it was a real relief to be able to send them all to you. <laughs> Get them out of my uh, house. They were at mom's mostly. Actually, I, I panicked a little bit. My mother had all the, the Emmys and my Tony whenever, you know, because you're always trying to get mother, mother's attention, we all know that. And, and it also pissed off my siblings, which was fun. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, one of those times, I guess two years ago or something, um, or three seasons ago, uh, I was up again for a judging Amy. I had not taken home the prize in a couple of years, and I thought, well, you know, I think maybe this year I'd like to have the girls in my house. So when I come home without the prize, I'll be able to look at these, you know, uh, prizes and say, well, you know, Ty, that's okay. So I put them all in the back, in the trunk of my car, and from mom's house, and drove them over to um, my house and set them up. The Tony looked at them, and then it was really nice, because that year I did one, win the other Emmy, so it was a nice even kick line, because it was like six <laughs> behind the one rather than five, which is a little messy. Uh, prizes. Um, I don't think it's anything you can work for. It's nothing I've ever said, you know, here's the show this year that will be the Emmy, the show you put up for the Emmy. Uh, so it's nice, but it's not what, uh, what I'm after. Uh, I, I'll tell you, oh, I'll tell you a nice prize story. Got a minute? Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> the first time I was nominated for any kind of award, I think you probably have it, it was a made-up award. It was kind of, I don't know who was sponsoring it. it was, uh, you know, it was kind of the newcomer of the year award, and I was the newcomer of the year. They told you this beforehand, that you were going to win it. It was up at Universal Studios at the... For all I know, the hotel gave out the prize. I have no idea. And the other newcomer of the year was J that handsome John from um, Dynasty. John. Thank you very much. John Forsythe. John Forsythe was the other newcomer of the year. <laughs> so this is, I'll tell you how, what a gymcrack thing this was. 
And I always thought John Forsyth sort of looked like my dad. So I, I had a little crush on him. I thought he was great. So I thought I'd get to have dinner with John Forsyth. This is great. You know, they would go up and get dressed up. And so we hired a limousine. This, this is pre, or maybe the first year of Cagney and Lacey. Maybe it was for Cagney, the first, that first, and we were canceled. It was over. Um, so anyway, we went to the thing, and I got my prize, which is this kind of uh, plastic, uh, uh, clear plastic thing with a little star and a little Mylar band, the <laughs> best newcomer of the year. And we're, we went home, um, and I had my prize, and I was my first kind of acting award. It was very neat. And I got home, and all of the toilets in my house had, had burst open, and the new uh, shag rug that I put in the kids' bathroom that I, I got as a remnant um, was just a sea of shit. And <laughs> I took my dress, and I kind of tucked it up into my you know, thing, and started to clean this up. And I looked at the deity, and I said, I get it. I get it. I got the sea of shit. I get, I'm, I'm, I'm totally leveled. I, I'm not going to, I promise not to get, you know, too impressed by this stuff because the message is really clear. And so that was a good, that was a break. That was what I call a real break. Mm. It's a true story. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> anyway, uh, so I like him and it's nice and I'm one of those people who really does like the nomination. The fact that I, I've never done a television show when I didn't have a nomination for the work. Show up. Two seasons of, so that feels like quality control. I, I mean, if there had been a year when I you know, did that kind of grueling 14 hours a day, nine months out of the year, and didn't get a nomination, I, I probably would have been a little angry. Um, but I do like the nominations. They, they make me happy. The prize itself is like, it's a horse race. See, it, horse races are not run for the benefit of the horses. <laughs> it's the owners and the spectators. The horses know their, their thoroughbreds. The horses would prefer to be having lunch in the field. <laughs> but they have to put their silks on, you know, because somebody, and run because the owners and the, and, the, and the spectators want them to do it. But the horses know that they're, you know, it's not for the horses, honey. So that's, you know, it's not for us. You've, it's for you've, all. you've addressed this already when I asked you about <laughs> uh, the enforcer. But what do you look for in a role before signing, signing on? It seems to me that you've been very sharp and um, very um, intelligent in how you formed your career and the roles that you took on and what you c could give to them. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, you, there are jobs you take just, you know, for, to pay for the kids' expensive schools or something. Mm -hmm. um, but you, the actor, the act, I was raised to think that the actor did not have the luxury of a no. And that's not quite true. You can say, I'm not going to participate in this if you really don't want to. Right after the enforcer, or, well, after the enforcer, I didn't work for a year and a half because everybody thought I was a cop. Um, <laughs> so I was not going to get into the movies. And I, the movies is like the Marines, you know. I, I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't pass the physical uh, in the movies. That's a, that's a specialized thing. Um, but anyway, they, they, at some point or another, they asked me to do this movie. My agent asked me to go in on a meeting. They were making a movie for $20 million, which at that time was an awful lot of money. And the movie was about people who ate dead human flesh. And I said, you know, I really don't want to go to this meeting, but I would like to uh, make a phone call. I'll call them. I would, I would like to call them. Uh, <laughs> this is also pre-Cagney pre Lacey. Um, anyway, I called them up and I said, um, I just have to tell you that I think what you're doing is, is deeply corrupt, and for $20 million, you can make five decent movies, and I wouldn't make a movie about people who eat dead human flesh if my children were starving to death goodbye. And that felt really good to do. Um, you know, because we did need the money and all that, but not that badly. Uh, so, yeah, you, you can say no. It's nicer to say yes. What do I look for? I look for somebody that I think I can breathe life into, that I can take her off the page and she'll turn into a person um, that somebody will, will recognize. I've, on the stage, I've played everything from, you know, 87-year-old French matriarch to an eight-year-old black boy. Now, they don't hire you when you're 32 years old to play eight-year-old black boys in television. They just don't do it if you're a 36-year-old white girl. But they do in the theater, which, and that's really fun. That kind of experimenting is fun. Um, but. Uh, a human being, if I can figure out how to make her, I like telling stories about human beings. Stage fright and performance anxiety. Do you have any superstitions or rituals or things that get you psyched to go on stage? 
I told you, I just saw this wonderful thing I wish I could knew who to attribute it to. Uh, it was a show on television about um, dispelling superstitions and a person who was quoted as saying, I, I, I don't believe in being superstitious because I think it's bad luck. Uh, <laughs> I don't have, I have some talismans. You know, I have, a, I have a, a makeup kit that my kid brother gave me when I was, uh, it's a fishing tackle box. He gave it to me when I was 15, I guess. And I sort of said, thanks, Timmer. He, uh, he was five. And, and then the parents, you know, they already knew that I wanted to do this. So they, they took me into the living room and there was this kind of lap rope that we had on a French uh, day bed. And it was all bunched up in a thing. They said, reach in. You know? So I reached in and there was a pot of Miron and there was a brush and there was another brush. And there was, it was my first makeup kit. So I had that makeup kit and I liked to have it. When they lost it on the road when I was doing a, a gypsy, I freaked out. F bad freak out. But it was then recovered. Um, I have little little bits and pieces of, of stuff that uh, I'm nostalgic about. Um, if I lost it, could I not function? No, I'd probably function anyway. Uh, but I don't have any particular things. I do, do tend to, um, to uh, uh, land on people if they whistle in the theater and make them go outside and turn around and spit and stuff. <laughs> but it's mostly just to teach them about theater law. Lore. It's it's not about anything. I really, I just um, <laughs> I like to scare people. <laughs> Scaring people is good. You know, I, when I was in, we were in uh, doing Gypsy in in uh, somewhere, a huge theater in uh, St. Louis. It's got I don't know some unbelievable amount of people see it, and it's a long, long stage. And we had Gypsy is a small show. You know, it's, it's the chorus, there's six chorus boys, and it's a little show in this huge stage, as long as this, maybe, with two live oaks on the sides and all that stuff. And the precept that came out of working in St. Louis was if you, uh, well, I don't have to say a bad word. This is Boston, isn't it? <laughs> Oops. Um, if you can't entertain them, scare them. <laughs> scare people, if you, you know, uh, if you can't entertain them, scare the uh, MFs. Okay. <laughs> well, tell us about <laughs> Gypsy, what the Gypsy experience was like for you. I mean, that was a, it was, it must have been some anxiety into stepping into a role that had um, people before you who really played it and played it and played it. And then you took it in different places. What was that like? Um, I got a letter. Uh, from a man named uh, Barry Brown saying it's the 30th anniversary of Gypsy. And uh, Mr. Sondheim and Mr. Uh, Stein and Mr. Lawrence uh, can't think of anybody they'd rather have in this role than you. <laughs> and I thought, the hell you say, this is impossible. But I, you know. So we started negotiations with the, uh, with the uh, cause that's a, that was a role I dreamed about since I was about 13. I, my dad's agent was approached by, uh, my dad's agent approached my dad when I was 13 to say, would I want to audition for The Young Gypsy? <clears throat> and um, that was when my parents made me decide whether or not to be a kid actor. They sat me down and they said, you know, this is what's going to have to happen. You'll have to quit school and somebody will have to live with you in New York and stuff and stuff and stuff. And you can't go to the audition unless you can say yes. So I went and wept in my room and stuff and came out because I already did want to be an actress a lot. And I said, no, I can't go to the audition. So, but we went to the show. Because we went to all the shows then in New York. Uh, my, uh, my dad was a theater actor in New York. And when I went to see the show, I thought, well, uh, the kid's gone in the you know, uh, middle of the uh, first act. I want to be that woman. I want to be, th I wanna be that, that, that. So that was a long-standing dream to play Rose. At any rate, um, so we allowed us how, yes, we wanted to. We would be, my agent and I would be a nice thing to be in Gypsy. And the next letter I got after this letter saying, you're the only person we can possibly think of, was um, a kind of a terse little letter that said, your audition for Mr. Stein and Mr. Lawrence and Mr. <laughs> Sondheim is on this date at the Winter Garden Theater. Yeah. So, um, so it, my invitation had quickly turned into an audition. Um, I don't know, I just, I worked on it. Then they didn't have enough money, then there was a delay. So through the whole delay of when they were trying to raise the money, I was working on it. Um, the ghost of Ethel was certainly there. Uh, one of my treasured telegrams, there aren't any telegrams anymore, mm -hmm. 
that terrible? You can't send a thing. You can send a fax or an email, shall we? But those little yellow guys are fun. I maybe I, did I give that to you? I might have retained that one. It's my favorite telegram anybody ever sent me. It was from my auntie uh, Kathy, and she said, uh, "Dear Tino, break a legend," <laughs> which is genius. <laughs> At yeah. any rate, um, yeah, there were ghosts to tilt with. What was there was Arthur Lawrence directing his own play and determined to uh, revive it. And reviving means you know, breathe life into. Not just another summer stock version of, you know, every lady that ever was wants to play Mama Rose. I'm not really sure why. She's an awful woman. Uh, and the opening night, how did that feel? Opening night in, on Broadway mm -hmm. felt fine because we'd done 14 cities. Mm -hmm. We had toured for better part of a year, and I knew my job. Um, if we had done a month of previews and opened in New York, it would have been an entirely different story. But it was a combination of being smart and being greedy, because the producers wanted to make their money back before we ever went in. So we had already earned the money on the road. Um, but in this process, it was a shakedown cruise for me. So, so I really, so opening night in New York was good. I thought it was kind of a, you know, like a, about a B minus in terms of what I could do, in terms of that specific night. But uh, opening nights are false in New York anyway. I just had an opening night in New York. There wasn't a single critic there. They'd all been there the two weeks before. They come during previews. The, opening night is not this, that's a fantasy opening night, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. You have three daughters. How do you balance your career as a mother and as an actor? <laughs> very, very badly. <laughs> uh, can't be done, actually. Um, I'm the mother of, of, of adults only now, so I, I don't have <laughs> any children. I have grandchildren, two grandchildren. Um, the kids turned out, um, I think it's a miracle. Uh, my oldest daughter was between the ages of 14 and uh, 20 when I was doing Cagney and Lacey, big years. My littlest girl was 11 to 17. Um, Sandy was born the third season of, of Cagney and Lacey. I was a busy woman. Um, I'm not, you're, I'm not going to write the advice book, honey. I don't know how to, I don't know how I did. It's a miracle. They turned out. I think that, uh, women can have it. Can women have it all? Sure, but not all at the same time. <laughs> so you have to sort of choose your spots, you know. Every time I had a kid, they told me it was the wrong time to have a kid. That I do know. First kid, they said, you can't do that. You've just done your first play on Broadway. You can't, you can't be at this impossible. Don't do it. Second kid, you can't do that. I, uh, so, but it was always so very clear to me that it was kid time. You know, the bell had gone off, so I couldn't pay any attention to those people. Um, Last time I had a kid was, we, I had been involved in this show, and I was 39 years old, and um, I thought, you know, I better get busy, or this is my, my, my last chance, you know? So I said to the old man, let's go down to Jamaica, it worked like a charm. <laughs> How do you feel? I, little did I know that we wouldn't be having babies when they were 52 years old. <laughs> How do you feel about your daughter, Catherine Dora Brown, pursuing an acting career? How do you really feel? How do I really feel? I don't want to hear politically correct what you tell her. How do you really feel? I think she's chosen a terribly difficult field. She's a woman of color. She's a black dress, as she says, um, it's, which puts her low man on the totem pole in this society uh, and in this business. Um, I sort of figured out she opened in a play at the Mark Taper Forum, which is where I did a number of productions. And when she first went down to audition there, there was nothing but pictures of her father and me all over the wall. The intimidation was huge. She's third generation. Um, and I had a realization the night, the afternoon of the night before she opened of why my parents did not want me to be an actor. They had, my dad was very bad and mean about it. My mother was a little more uh, gentle because she would teach me my words, but they both advised against it. Don't do it. It's an impossible field for a woman. It's harder for women than for men, blah, blah, blah. Too many actresses and you know, all that stuff. The reason was not, and I knew that they loved the theater and I knew they revered it and I knew they'd both worked in it and, the reason was not that they did not want me to be an actress. The reason was they did not want to be the parents of an actor. To be the parent of an actor is the worst thing in the whole world. It's just awful. And so 
because you can't do anything, and the suffering of that the kid is good. It's just awful. So that's what I found out about Catherine. You know that that it wasn't. It was. I just. It's all. I. I hate being the mother of an actress. It's <laughs> horrible. That's how I really feel. Thank you. <laughs> I had an idea that might be like that. <laughs> oh, What's a revelation? Though? You worked with your brother Tim Daly on Wings and your father James Daly on Medical Center and your daughter, Catherine Dora Brown, in a TV movie, The Wedding Dress. Tell, it, tell us what it's like working with your family. Oh, man. Uh, well, I got my equity card when I was 15 because my dad, you know, I was in a play with my dad at the, at the uh, Bucks County Playhouse in Pennsylvania. Some of you may have been there. Um, <laughs> It was a trick. Uh, it was also the first big heartbreak. My father's agent came to my dad and he said, there's this lovely play, uh, Gene Kerr play, Jenny Kissed Me. You'll play the priest, Tyna will play Jenny, uh, hoping my mother can play the, the screaming maid. Uh, there's a little part for Glynis, the younger sister, and we'll, we'll make up a walk-on for Tim. Uh, he was, Timmy was five. If I was 15, he was five. My older sister was smart, too smart to be involved. So Dad said, sure, that might be fun. We'll do this thing, you know, a little summer deal, and it's got a kind of, it's got a gimmick, uh, the family that plays together. And then about uh, three weeks before we went, we did it, uh, we went into rehearsal, my dad's agent came to Dad, he said, she said, um, you know, Tyne's not ready. So I've got this lovely actress named Becky Dark, and she can play Jenny, and Tyne can play the girl with the fat legs in the third <laughs> uh, scene of the second act. So I was demoted. <laughs> And I had to wear symmetricals. You know what symmetricals are? Uh, they're things to make you have fat legs. And then in the second scene, you took them off and your legs were, I, I have good legs. Um, <laughs> anyway, so that was hard because the, the, the part was supposed to be mine and it went to another client of my dad's. Um, that time was very difficult. I remember I started, I had two scenes in the play. I started into one speech and messed up and went back to the front of the thing again. And I came off the stage and my dad, <laughs> Amateur, amateur, <laughs> amateur. How no one get ready? Never, this <laughs> never started. You let them know it was a speech by going back, quaking in my boots. Um, Not easy. Oh, um, when by the time he got to medical center, which was also he was helping me. You know, I thought I'd change my name and <laughs> deny my family and all that stuff. And then I, you know, I, I wanted to work and use everything you got. So. The folks on Medical Center put me in this thing and playing my dad's daughter. So they get a TV guy to could say, you know, here's Titan, James Daly and his daughter playing, what do you know, father and daughter. Um, and what I remember from that time was that my father and I, in those days on MGM, you had, they had permanent uh, uh, dressing rooms for the actors right by the sets. So we had like this little house in the corner of one of those great gaping stages at uh, MGM. And we were waiting for a setup or something, and I went in to talk to him about the scene. We had a kind of intricate scene. And we were in the middle of having the discussion. I said, you know, Dad, this is, the, this is the first time we've really ever talked about acting together. I've talked with Mama, but this is the first time we've discussed acting. And he said, well, of course, we're working together. What's the point of talking about acting if you're not working together? <laughs> There's nothing to say. This is the first time I've had anything to say to you about. Uh, Daddy. <laughs> um, Working with my brother was fun. Um, I was nervous because he did a half-hour television show, and I'd never done that form. And uh, you, have any of you ever seen a half-hour sitcom? You're not hearing me? Oh, hell. I'm nattering on, and you're not hearing me? Why'd you say something earlier? Jesus, Lord. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, on these shows, they have a band, and they have a comic, and they have all these people keeping the audience awake. And it's wild, and there's no place for quiet, and there's no place to prepare yourself. And so I was, uh, that, made, that threw me a lot. We had fun, though. He, my brother Tim is a great boss. He was sort of the, the leader of the pack there at, on Wings. Um, not that he was the boss boss, but he was the example. So I like working with my brother. Um, and my kid, she was on uh, Judging Amy for a while playing the, uh, the girlfriend of, of uh, Richard T. Jones. And I, we didn't have any scenes together. 
they were afraid to put us in scenes together because we, we look alike. Despite the melanin count, we actually look quite alike. Um, so they tried it in one little scene, uh, and it didn't really work. Uh, uh, in Wedding Dress, that was the same trick that I had done with my dad. You know, the, 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 the actual parent of the kid plays the actual... And I, I got these wonderful, uh, I mean, ridiculously funny um, interviewers who'd call up and say, well, you know, I've seen the picture, and, and you know, it looks like you and your daughter really do, uh, do uh, uh, like each other. Um, <laughs> I say, yeah, you know, I like her. Um, it was easy, that one. That one was easy. I like playing with her. She's a, she's a very... Um, Facile is a bad word, but she's, she's an easy actor. She's got a lot of skills. What was your most rewarding role of all the mediums that you've been in? I hate to do this to you, Mama. My, being a mother of my children, those are my best productions. I cannot lie to you about that. Woohoo! That's, you know, real life. The other thing is pretend life. This is professional schizophrenia is what I do. I've been a professional schizophrenic for 45 years. Um, I was, I've had imaginary biographies over, over the years, you know, of the, one of my early ones was called um, No Acting in the Car or Mommy, Mommy, Why Are You Making That Face? Uh, <laughs> uh, but my most recent one, which came out of uh, Judging Amy, uh, is, is called um, She Gets 14 Hours. Because she does get 14 hours and then you get 10. And you have to sleep four of them, which means then you get six to have for your life. And so it's, it's a weird thing to do. But I have to say that I really do prefer my own life to any of the lives that I've pretended to have. What are your future plans if you're going to work till age 87? <laughs> what do you look forward to accomplishing in the next decade? Well, some of it's my own life. Uh, I, I figure. I've now sort of earned the right to, to pick and choose. I have to stay off television for at least five to ten years so that I can be rediscovered um, <laughs> in my 70s. Um, I like to circumnavigate the globe uh, without benefit of airplanes. So I'm going to do, you know, I've got this imaginary thing because I'd like to be able to do that. I'd like to go back to college um, and complete an education that I abandoned. Uh, in terms of acting plans, I don't have any right now. Uh, at the end of um, uh, Judging Amy, I fired my agents and my um, managers and said, thank you, fellas, but uh, now I'd like to be a person without portfolio for a while. Um, the Manhattan Theatre Club found me for Rabbit Hole, which was a very wonderful experience. So right at the moment, I think the only thing I'd like to do is new plays. I have people approaching me about... <laughs> Hello, Dolly, which is bad casting. Uh, you know, um, what else? They asked me to do the, um, the little Marion Seldes part in Death Trap and stuff like that. They've, they're sniffing around now again because I went back on the stage. Um, I have a friend who's going to do the Greeks out in um, California at, uh, oh, what do you call that? The uh, um, Getty Museum. I have a new wonderful Greek theater. So I read through Fedra and I read through Medea, you know, both nurses now, because I'm past those, those big girls, uh, uh, those main girls. Uh, I'm less interested in celebrating old plays than I am in finding new ones right at the moment. I, I don't really know why. It's just a phase. I might get over it. Well, you got a lot of years, <laughs> you know, so it doesn't matter. I don't have time to turn myself into a classical actress. I, I, my old man used to say, you're not a great actor unless you play the great roles. Well, what happened with my career is, is that you do the best of what's available and you find out stuff. So it, it what led me down a different path. Yes, I studied uh, to do Shakespeare and stuff like that. Um, but I think that uh, when I did Cagney and Lacey, I realized that I was going to be in service in my own time. That what I was good at was, was playing now. Uh, so I've sort of made my peace with that, about having that be my, my niche. What advice would you give a young actor going into... Don't do into it. Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. Sorry, let me, what's the question? If one were to consider going into the profession of acting... I don't want the competition, it's just so And they much. weren't your daughter. <laughs> What about would you going say? into... Um, well, uh, if they felt don't, as don't, compelled as you yeah, did. Don't do it unless you have to. Don't do it unless you have to. 
Um, it's not a, it's not, I think it's, it's a profession. I don't think it's just a, a, you know, a yard to play in for a while. Um, so don't do it unless you have to. If you have to, um, then the best way to learn about it is to, is, is to act where, whenever and wherever you can. Just say yes for the first 20 years. Uh, except movies about people eating dead human flesh. <laughs> um, I, just I don't really know. I, I, when I get blue and depressed, I think we should not be training young actors, we should be training contestants. That the state of television is horrible, that there are no more guest spots on, on regular shows, that there are no more movies of the week, that there's no place to work out and train. That training in soap operas is, it trains you from here up, there's no body, there's no, you know, uh, that's only when I'm feeling very uh, crummy about the whole thing, which happens periodically. Um, what do you say to young actors? Do the best you can. I'll tell you this, learn a poem a day. Are there any young actors here? Not very many. Where are your students? We'll talk to them another day. Learn, well, that's what I did. The cheapest, the cheapest way to train is to learn a poem a day. It doesn't cost anything at all. It keeps your mind facile. Um, and I mean out loud, learn a poem a day. That'd be. I just want to read the quote, Ben Brantley, who can be sometimes very nasty. Uh-huh. Um, I can tell the audience that you had told me that you had not given any interviews before the opening of Rabbit Hole. No, that was a, that was a. And, uh, I was very interested to see what his reaction would be, given the fact that, you know, he was... Well, I should explain that a little bit. The, uh, 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 Manhattan Theatre Club, you sign up to do a short run. It's a quarter. From, I was there from December till April for rehearsal. And, uh, and, then, um, and it's a Lord B contract. That means no money for anybody. Uh, but I love this play. But I did make one extension to the standard Lord B contract, which was that I didn't want to talk to the press um, for a number of reasons, but I, I really didn't, and I managed to hold to that uh, just because, except for this here, explaining what you do and why you do it has gotten a little old after 40 years. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to see if the work could stand by itself without any of the celebrity stuff, which is an extra job now. Maybe always was, but it's, a, it's, a, it's another job besides being an actor is to be a celebrity. Uh, and I'm not very good at it. I'm a pretty good actor. I'm a, I'm a lousy celebrity. So I just didn't want to do that anymore. Well, I think it's a great, a great accomplishment when oh. he writes, Miss Daly is one of our finest American actresses working. <laughs> Are we done? With the questions. Oh, questions. Oh, okay. We're going to do a few questions. You don't Anybody have any I told questions? You <laughs> no questions. Oh, Rosalie. I'd like to say that Boston University Theatre Boston University Theater does encourage new young playwrights. So we have a lot of good creative stuff going on here. In fact, um, Sophie Flew, have, Sonia Flew, did you hear of that? Well, when it comes back here to Boston, people don't miss it. It's about during the time of Castro when families were flying their children out of Cuba to save their lives. And this is about a young girl whose parents send her off to America. And she That's my husband's story. My husband's family left Cuba fleeing Baptista when he was eight. Well, you, must, you must actually get hold then of Sonia Flu and come up here and do it for us. <laughs> You have my telephone number, call me up. I have no longer have an agent, just call me up. <laughs> Question. You said that uh, Rosie was what you always wanted to play, Gypsy Rosalie. Um, what other role have you always wanted to play but you have not yet? Well, actually, I always wanted to play is, 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 is a... Now I'm wondering if that's true. I never had a list of things that I thought I had to, had to do, you know. Um, um, 
So I, I, you know, I, th I thought I really wanted to play Mother Courage, and I died the death. The first thing that's out there as a thing from Mother Courage that I did in Dublin a couple of years ago was terrible. Believe me, terrible. Not entirely my fault. But uh, um, I never really had a list of stuff I, I had to do. Um, you know, and on my list now, Juliet, but hey, that's over. Uh, unless we do it on the radio. Uh, but maybe a decent nurse there. Um, I know, I think I... I think I found out that I, that I was going to give that part up, the how do you do it part, or what am I supposed to do next part. That's in the lap of the gods. Uh, I'll t tell you another very long story. Or well, let me see if I. Um, I'm in LA, I'm driving on the freeway, and having my yearly fantasy called I Win the Oscar. Every actor has this fantasy. Uh, this is, I think, also before I'd won any prizes yet. Um, and in my fantasy, uh, my dad had recently died. In my fantasy, I found myself thanking my dead father. And I thought, from the grave, this guy, from the grave, I'm thanking the dead father. I did not get my talent from my father. This is, I'm driving on the freeway, terribly dangerous. Uh, but, you know, an actor's kid is always saying, oh, did you inherit your talent? Did you get the talent? And that has, rankles. Y yes, if you're related to somebody in the business, you can get in the door. Once you get in that door, you're the one who has to deliver. But, but the, uh, you know, so I thought, I didn't get my, my talent from my dad. I got my talent from the same place my dad got his talent, from the talent giver. <laughs> so, and it was, you know, so given the fact that I have some facility for this, you tell me what to do next. I stopped trying to go to the right agent. I stopped trying to, you know, manipulate myself into, the, into, the, into some cocktail party with a bunch of people. I quit at that point trying to figure out what the next step was. And I sort of interiorly gave over and said, okay, I've got this talent package. What's going to happen next? And what happened next was Cagney Lacey. That's actually a story, a real story. So I don't have a list. Um, I figure this will reveal itself. Yeah, when I quit acting, uh, you know, last year in April, <laughs> when we were canceled, I was going to take a year off and travel the world. And then the Manhattan Theater Club found me with, with Rabbit Hole, and it was such a good play that came to me on a telephone call from, uh, you know, because I didn't have an agent or that. I thought, well, okay, so I guess I have to do rabbit hole. So I did rabbit hole. What's next? I don't know. <laughs> sure. Hi there. Hi. Um, in judging Amy, phenomenal is, is not even a great word for how great you were. Um, I often found myself when I was watching the show that that was really you. Like, you know, I would have to pause it and go, I can't believe how good she is. Like, I couldn't even watch it. I was so amazed. <laughs> so I'm sitting here wondering and listening to you. I'm wondering how, okay, you're great, you're wonderful, you're talented, blah, blah, blah. But how much of you connected with that role? Like, or did you relate to that role? Sure. I mean, I'm not a social worker, and we, we did, you do the research, and you, and you figure out how that goes. Um, um, what I was interested about in terms of you sign up for something, and they say it's going to be, a, you know, a, a t television series. And I had, I, I had done about four or five years of independent movies, and then I realized that I had to actually pay for the apartment. You know, I, that I've had to stop mucking around because not one of those five or six movies that I made ever saw the light of day, and they don't pay you anyway. It was time to go back on TV, which is a nice paycheck. So there were, there were four different television shows, the television scripts that were in the offing at that time, and I, you know, I could have had the job that Betty White had that year. I could have had the job that, uh, that uh, uh, what's her face, um, Delta Burke had that year, or the one that I, that I got and chose that I wanted more. What, you, what I look for in, you know, when it's a series is how can I live with this person for a while? What I liked in the setup of, of um, Judging Amy was the setup. It was uh, the Waltons for the 90s. It was, it was intergenerational. You got three women, you got the granny and the, and the woman and her, and her kid. So I thought there's possibilities in there. That's, that's what, I, what I was attracted to. You never know if it's going to go more than, you know, 11 or 13 or, you know, one season. That's... That's in the lap of the gods, too. Um, but I liked that we were going to look at that dynamic. Um, and I joke with Amy because, um, you know, uh, 
I used to say to her, you think this is a show about a woman with an impossible mother and a difficult child. I think it's a show about a wonderful woman with three impossible children and a grandchild. <laughs> and that, that's, there's, there, my fan base thinks that's the show and your fan base, that's, that's why we have a successful show. <laughs> I have two questions. Uh, first, you said that the prizes aren't what uh, you're after. So ultimately, what is it that you are after? Storytelling. I like telling stories. And uh, I was brought up to believe that, that uh, human beings love to hear stories about themselves and need to hear stories about themselves. And they've always liked that, and they always will. And so I figure it's a job that's, you know, it's not going to run out. Um, I like to hear stories. I, I still like going to the theater and, and having people tell, you know, when people tell me stories successfully, I like it. Um, in my childhood, there was a, a book called Granny's Wonderful Chair. It's about a little girl who has a magic chair, and the chair tells stories. And she goes through a set of circumstances to the court of the king. And after the chair has told a story, at the end of each story, two people in the gathered company stand up. And they say to her, that's our story. And I always thought as a kid, if I could get two people in the gathered company to stand up and say, that's my story, then I would have done something important and real. So I'm, I, I do it to be a storyteller. That's my favorite thing. The rest of it is pretty annoying. <laughs> And the second question is, when you go back to college, what will you study? Economics, um, Greek, comparative religions, and I'm not sure, something else. Uh, I'm not sure, just, uh, just yeah, uh, yeah, stuff I don't know about, stuff I know nothing about. Sounds good, good luck with that. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Ma'am, who's, oh, who's the... Uh, Amy Brenneman wants to do a, a finish because we got the axe pretty uh, brutally. Um, everybody was, except for me, was ready for a seventh season. Um, uh, you know, and she was angry about how that was handled and wants to be able to make some kind of a neater um, finish. Um, I told her, you know, the reason they called it the axe is because it's painful. Uh, <laughs> So we'll see about that. that. She's working on that. She's the producer. I'm, I'm a hired hand. I don't know. From, from a business point of view, I was curious why you fired your agent versus just taking an unlimited amount of time off. And if you're, <laughs> you're happy with your royalties or syndication agreements uh, for future reruns. Oh, I'm never happy about residuals. When I, I, there was no money from uh, uh, Cagney and Lacey. Uh, the reason was that, that we fell into this trough where they started to sell off uh, television shows to cable. And no deals had been made about cable. So Sharon and I, at the top of the heap, um, before Orion Television went belly up, which they Orion Pictures was gone, um, Sharon and I got 11 cents a show. Uh, and the people that were lower than that. So I had a lot of, lot of uh, 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 checks, stacks of checks for 11 cents that uh, um, they said it, actually Orion said to me out loud, it was not worth them to pay the CPA to figure out what the little piddling, so, so the annuity that was supposed to be there never happened. Um, if there's an annuity from uh, uh, judging Amy, I'm not sure because the same thing is happening. We're being strip mined on television, so twice a day you can see the product that took us six and a half years to make will be seen in about uh, 18 months. Um, and I actually don't know what I realized from that in terms of residuals. Um, but I do have a business manager and I can give you his card if you <laughs> like. Uh, <laughs> Oh, thank you. Um, uh, why did I fire my, my representatives? Because I wanted to have a, a direct, I want to be able now, you know, that people actually sort of know who I am in the business, to be able to look them right in the face and say, okay, um, what am I worth to you? When do you need me? And you tell me without a, without a, a go-between. It's just an experiment. If it doesn't work, I'll, I'll advertise for representation and, and, you know. But I, I got weary of the games that are played between uh, the talent 
and the producers. So just for a while, I'm going to make them call me up. I, I told my lawyer, because uh, I did get a lawyer, um, that he should just give them my number. And he said, you mean your, your telephone number? And I said, yeah, like my home number. If they want it, just call me up. Because I don't understand right at the moment the, the use of the, uh, the middleman. So in a couple of years, I'll come back, and we'll see how it's working. <laughs> if you were the head of a uh, network, how would you improve TV? We all agree we need improvement. Oh, gee. I'm so glad I don't run the zoo, I can hardly tell you. I'm just one of the animals on display. Um, I've never wanted to be the boss. I'm not very sympathetic about bosses because I'm an old communist and uh, um, I don't understand. That's why I'd study economics when I went back to college to try and figure out what it is that what they do. Um, I have seen the business change so drastically. Um, you know, in the old days when my dad was doing an hour in television called The Foreign Intrigue, which we, he did in Europe, which is one of the reasons I went to all those schools, um, they did an hour of television and they did in a season 39 shows, 39 shows and then 13 weeks off. That's 52 weeks of the year. Now it's the reverse. The Sopranos make 13 shows a year with the 39 weeks off. So does um, uh, uh, Six, feet, Six under. feet Under or those, those cable shows have the luxury of that. Um, I remember when it went to 36 shows a year. I remember when it went to 28 shows a year and then 24 and then 22. <laughs> uh, we made an average of 22 um, on Judging Amy for lots more money and lots more time and a lot less good. And I don't know why that's true. Mm -hmm. uh, I wish I did, sort of. Um, but I wish they'd spend more time on tell, I, you know, in the wishing department, I wish they'd spend more time telling stories than, than having contests. That's for sure. Yeah. But to get rich quick, you know. Well. Are we done? Call this around. lady's been oh. very patient. Uh, <laughs> last question. Um, Kenny and Lacey ran, what, about 25 years ago? And the themes <laughs> were very relevant at the time. And I recently were watching a lot of the uh, episodes. And it is amazing to me how uh, up to date right now that those episodes and the themes of those episodes were. Did you know when you were making those uh, episodes at the time um, how long lasting it would be uh, in, in society? Well, I think we felt that we had then that uh, uh, sort of disgusting phrase, window of opportunity. We had a little time there when girl stuff was, you know, uh, in the headlines and all that. And, uh, the trick of Cagney Lacey was very simple. The women were the subject of the show rather than the object of the show. Mostly it was about the women and what happened to them rather than the men and what happened to them, which is what it's mostly about. It's, and it's still mostly about. There are better roles for women on television, but they're still satelliting around the main guy. I, any of the ones that you look at that are popular, there's a guy and then there are these women who are around. So it made, first of all, it made the other actors that were in our show very uncomfortable and angry. They just weren't used to it. They didn't know how to be, you know, is Becky and the lieutenant and all that stuff, when this, because these stories were about these women, which was deeply distressing and annoying to them. Um, <laughs> And fortunately, it has never happened since, so we don't have to worry about it. Uh, that's another reason I liked doing a, a Judging Amy, though, was, you know, was about the women, uh, which I normally play, except for that eight-year-old black boy I told you about before. Uh, um, mostly women I play, and so you know, it's hard to find a spot. Um, here's the deal. Human beings don't change very much very fast. So that's why we can till, still tell the Greek stories or the Shakespeare or the, you know, because the, the stuff still applies. We're just not that smart. That's why you have to keep telling these stories over and over again, you know, until, it, until you get it. Um, so I'm not really surprised that the stories, even though they're sort of ripped from the headlines of 1982 or whatever, uh, um, I'm glad to hear that if you don't think they've aged too badly. I think if you tell a story well, to begin with, if you make it well and you tell it well, uh, 
then it has some lasting value because because we're just we don't, we're we're pretty slow, so we have to keep telling just good stories over and over again until we get it. Stuff like the Ten Commandments. <laughs> What's here's the instructions? What's so hard to understand? <laughs> don't kill anybody. Don't steal anybody's stuff. Don't fool around with this guy's wife. You know, it's just there. It is. It's quite clear, culturally across the world. But we seem to not be able to behave like that. Don't ask me why. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that's the program, and the bar is open. Thank you.